I'm Dr. Rose Hartzell, and I got my PhD from Indiana University, where the Kinsey Institute is. Has anyone ever heard of Alfred Kinsey or the Kinsey Institute? Raise your hand if you have. Okay. Um, I also got an EDS and master's degree there, and I'm currently working as a sex therapist at San Diego Sexual Medicine. I am Catherine Gania. I'm a nurse practitioner. Um, I've been a nurse for about 15 years, nurse practitioner for the last five. Um, my schooling was up in Michigan. Um, I currently work for San Diego Sexual Medicine and am heavily involved in um, some research trials on sexual dysfunction. So first off, we just want to thank you for having us here. Uh, a lot of times sexuality is an uncomfortable topic for many people and even for many doctors. They don't bring it up with their patients. And so, um, I don't know if Sue's in the room or not, thank you so much for thinking about this and inviting us to come speak here um, and giving you the opportunity to learn more about your sex lives. So our goal today, um, if we do anything, is to hope to, we hope to inspire and educate and motivate you to make better decisions regarding your sex life and to feel more empowered. So um, as, she, as we both mentioned, we come from San Diego Sexual Medicine. Uh, we are located in San Diego. And uh, yeah, no brainer, huh? <laughs> um, and we uh, take an integrated approach. So we, we take what we call a biopsychosocial approach to treating different sexual health conditions. Basically, in English, that just means we take a holistic perspective. So uh, we have. Uh, Catherine, who's our nurse practitioner, and Dr. Erwin Goldstein, who's a world-renowned sexual medicine physician. He's basically the person that invented sexual medicine as a field. We also have me, who's a sex therapist, and we have Debbie Cohen, who's our physical therapist, who unfortunately couldn't be here today. Um, and as I mentioned before, a lot of doctors don't feel comfortable talking about this. So throughout your treatment or even after treatment, you are going to have to be your own advocate and bring these questions or issues up to your physician. So also, before we begin, because I want you to feel comfortable asking questions, I'm going to have everyone just repeat after me. I'm going to have you few, say a few words. Okay. Bone marrow transplant. Okay, that was easy. Penis. Vulva. Wow, I'm impressed. So, <laughs> yeah, everyone's like, vulva. <laughs> um, so now you've already uh, embarrassed yourself in front of everyone. So when it comes to the question and answer period, it's going to be super easy to say those words. Okay, so we're here today to talk about sexual health after bone marrow transplant, but the problem is that there's not a lot of research out there on sexual health to start with in any any population. Um, this is one of the research studies that we do have on the prevalence of sexual dysfunction in the general population, and it looks like, you know, about 40% of women lack interest in sex, 20% of women have pain with sex. Um, 10 to 15 percent of men have uh, erectile dysfunctions. Um, there was a recent study done of about 50,000 women over the internet. One simple question was asked and it was, have you had pain with sex in the last 30 days? And 30% of women answered yes to that question. So, I mean, there is a lot of sexual dysfunction out there, but like Dr. Hartzell said, it's just not something that people are comfortable talking about, even, even bringing it up to your healthcare provider. Um, so it's really something that we need to do more research on. That being said, there is a, a little bit of research out there on sexuality after stem cell transplantation. And the thing that there are a lot of different treatments that are going to cause an increased risk of sexual dysfunction after uh, stem cell transplantation. One or two of them being chemotherapy and total body radiation. Um, this is toxic to what's called gonadal function, and gonadal function is basically the ability of your, your ovaries or your testes to make the sex hormones like estrogen, progesterone, testosterone um, that you really need to have adequate sexual functioning. Um, there's also some of the medications that patients are going to be given for um, things like chronic graft-versus-host disease. They also can induce a lot of sexual dysfunction in, in people, um, and let alone chronic graft-versus-host disease causing pain in women when it, when it affects the vaginal tissues. 
Um, so really, being a stem cell, bone marrow transplant patient, um, for men you can get impairment of testosterone and problems from that, and women you can get induction of ovarian failure. And a lot of this is going to cause sexual dysfunction in patients. Um, the other thing is there's a lot of health problems that can just go along with being a bone marrow transplant patient, being a cancer survivor, and just in the general population, like hypothyroidism, diabetes, heart disease, all of these are just health problems that you're going to come across that contribute to sexual dysfunction um, in, in, in people. So. And I know this slide is really complicated and hard to see, but basically it just shows you all the different things that can affect your sexual function. So Catherine's talked a little, a little bit about the biological side, but um, your psychology, if you have stress, or your relationship status, your, your sex history with your partner or other partners, all those different things can affect your sexuality after a bone marrow transplant. So um, recovery from a bone marrow transplant can take a long time, and the journey um, throughout the, the journey getting better can um, induce a lot of symptoms, including fatigue. And although after you recover, you might be feeling better, maybe have a newfound energy for life, some people may uh, still suffer with anxiety and depression. And there's been uh, a lot of research indicating that depression and sexual functioning are interrelated. And unfortunately, the medications that they sometimes use for depression, they don't tell you, but uh, like some types of different types of SSRIs can also cause sexual dysfunction. So you can have sexual dysfunction from the depression and then sexual dysfunction from the medications to take your depression away. Uh, so this study was looking at um, the difference between uh, people who've had bone marrow transplants and then um, versus those who've had just had chemotherapy, and they, they found that those who had um, bone marrow transplants had um, more risk for a decrease in interest in sex, sexual activity, decrease in pleasure, and decrease in ability to have sex. But ultimately, like Catherine said, we just there isn't really that much research out there look, looking at sexuality post um, bone marrow transplant. The other thing I just wanted to kind of take a step back and look at is it might not be the bone marrow transplant in general that's causing any type of sexual dysfunction. And so a lot of the different things that we're going to talk about today are, are things that can affect you following bone marrow transplant, but then also just in general. So, but one thing uh, I like to think of um, when I meet with people is, well, what did your sex life look like before you got cancer or before you've had any type of injury or illness. So if it, if it was complicated and hard then, um, now that there's something else going on, it, it probably is going to be even more complicated. So um, kind of looking at what your communication is like with your partner even before the um, bone transplant happened, marrow transplant happened. So we're going to go on to talk a little bit about the common sexual dysfunctions after a bone marrow transplant. And before I begin that, I was hoping to talk to you about how um, I, th I love, I see there's a lot of couples in the room, and I think that's really important. Sometimes people will come to us um, as an individual and not bring their partner and say, well, I'm the one with the problem. Well, ultimately, you're not if you're in a relationship because it affects both you and your partner. It's not like a broken arm. Um, if there's something wrong with your or not working in terms of um, your penis or vagina, it's going to affect your partner. Um, and an interesting thing that they found is they did uh, research on PD-5 inhibitors, which is, which is basically like in layman's terms like Viagra, Cialis, Levitra, all those medications that help to get those erections going. And what they found is that when they, uh, the erections were better with those medications, the woman, the, the female partner of that person who had erectile dysfunction, they started to have higher sexual desire. Um, more arousal. And so, interestingly, treating the male uh, led to better sexual satisfaction with the female. Um, there hasn't been research looking at the other way, but um, just a little thing to think about that, that, that what we're telling you today, if you're the bone marrow transplant um, survivor or the partner, it's going to affect you both. So the first thing we're going to talk about is erectile dysfunction. So with erectile dysfunction, there's many different reasons that you can have erectile dysfunction. There's neurological causes for erectile dysfunction, um, like strokes, multiple sclerosis. There's vascular causes for erectile dysfunction, like 
um, high cholesterol and plaque buildup in the arteries. Um, one of the more common ones that, that uh, you may see as a bone marrow transplant survivors would be hypogonadism, or like we talked about before, the lack of the ability of your body to produce adequate testosterone levels. Um, and when men do not have adequate testosterone levels, this can contribute to erectile dysfunction and inadequate erections. Um, another problem that Dr. Hartzell touched on a little bit is different medications that you're going to end up taking um, are going to also contribute to erectile dis uh, dysfunction. Antidepressants can contribute to um, erection problems. A lot of blood pressure medications that you're going to take are going to contribute to erectile problems. So there's a multitude of different reasons that you can see um, erectile difficulties. Um, the other thing is low testosterone in general. Any chronic health problem is going to give you, uh, is going to lower your testosterone level, whether it be diabetes or, or cancer or anything that's a chronic health problem is going to lower testosterone levels. But at the same time that ha that happens, as you age, it applies to both men and women actually, as you age you start to decrease your testosterone levels. And yes, testosterone is something that is needed for healthy female sexual function too. Um, and really for women, you start dropping your testosterone levels fairly young, you know, 30s, late 20s, you actually start decreasing these levels. So just aging in general is going to decrease the testosterone levels. And another thing is sometimes you don't, the symptoms that low testosterone can give you, people don't always pick up as, you know, maybe there's something going on with my testosterone level. Um, it doesn't just mean you're going to lose your libido or your sex drive. It doesn't just mean that you're going to have problems with erectile dysfunction. Um, you can get things like loss of energy, lack of motivation. You can get inability to concentrate, kind of a little bit of like a brain fog, weight gain. You can get a lot of uh, symptoms that you may not relate to testosterone deficiency. So there is lots of different psychological causes for erectile dysfunction as well. So Catherine kind of went over some of the biological problems, but some of the psychological ones might be, so let's say your partner, let's say you didn't have bone marrow transplant, but your partner did. So um, maybe you are not able to get an erection because your partner has the illness and you're afraid of hurting her or him. Um, also, the financial stress, maybe you've had a lot of medical bills going on. Um, you could uh, be having some depression or even uh, dealing with your own mortality. All those different things can affect erectile function. And unfortunately, a lot of times when men get sexual dysfunction, I've seen hundreds of men um, with what we call ED, um, they don't want to talk about it. And so a lot of times what they'll do is they'll just... Uh, because of it's so intertwined with self-confidence and masculinity, they'll just avoid sex altogether so they don't have to deal with it or have what they call a sense of failure. But what that leads to is for their partners sometimes can develop low self-esteem. They'll wonder, you know, is the partner having an affair? Is there something wrong with me? Am I fat? Am I ugly? Am I old? What's going on? Or the partners will just get resentful and say, like, why aren't they doing anything about it? Um, and unfortunately, that when couples... Um, start having some physical distance, so not uh, engaging in sexual activity for a really long time, that can lead to, um, physical distance can lead to emotional distance as well. So when we're talking about uh, treatment of erectile dysfunction, one of the first line things that we use is probably what all of you have heard of, PD. PDE5 inhibitors, things like Viagra, Cialis, Levitra, they can all help improve a man's erectile dysfunction. But sometimes this isn't good enough or this isn't going to work well enough for a patient. So some of the um, alternatives that we use are things called intracavernosal injections. This is teaching a man to give himself an injection in the penis, and this helps relax the smooth muscle and allow for adequate blood filling and adequate erection. I know it looks kind of scary, but really men, after getting over the initial injection, really can learn how to do this and, and really get a fulfilling sex life by using this, this form of injection. Um, the other thing is vacuum erection devices. This is an externally applied device over the penis, uses kind of the vacuum concept to pull blood into the penis and cause engorgement. Um, and then you place a constrictive elastic ring around the base of the penis to try and hold the blood in the penis. This is another way, it's a little less invasive, um, of being able to achieve an erection. 
Um, another thing that we do that isn't necessarily related to bone marrow transplantation or, or cancer survivors, anything like that, but it's penile revascularization. This is a man that has a blockage that um, is not perfusing the penis well enough to get an adequate erection, and we just kind of reroute blood flow around that blockage and, and improve erectile status. Another thing that you've probably heard of before are penile implants. We, we do do a lot of penile implants. Um, and one of the newer treatments that we have out there for erectile dysfunction is what's called drug-eluting stents. It's the same concept as having a stent put in your heart, say, after you've had a heart attack. Um, you get the same thing. You can get blockages that cause decreased blood flow to the penis. This is putting a stent in to open up um, an artery leading to the penis that's, that's blocked. So these are a few of the, the treatments that we use to help men that have erectile dysfunction. And then the obvious ones that I'm sure you've all heard of, um, just even lifestyle modifications can make a difference, just in terms of eating right, exercising, not using tobacco. That is like a huge one. And then learning how to decrease your stress and anxiety. So uh, Catherine talked a lot about the biological things that we can do um, in order to help erectile dysfunction, but sex therapy and counseling can, another, can be another big one. One thing can be lear to learn the couples to learn how to provide more stimulation to each other in order to help the erection come along. Also, it can help address any of the couple's relationship issues or communication problems. Um, it can also impact how the erectile function has impacted their relationship. So for instance, let's say someone has been dealing with erectile dysfunction for years, now now he has treatment. That's going to totally affect the, the dynamics of the relationship. And lastly, a sex therapist can help you incorporate any of those treatments mentioned into your relationship. So for instance, you saw the injections, right, that maybe sounded a little scary or um, mechanical. The way I would do it is we kind of talk about, well, how do we start using the injections as a couple? So maybe someone becomes the naughty nurse and, you know, I have some couples that that's how they know sex is going to occur that night. The, the partner will put the little, um, the needle on the person's pillow and that's how they know, okay, all right, tonight's the night. Um, so that's something that a sex therapist can help you do as a couple to incorporate some of that treatment into your sexual script. Ultimately, we can help you or doctors can help you to get a hard penis. We can do that. Science is shows us how to do that. But that's not going to solve any of your relationships or problems. That's one part of it. The rest is kind of up to you and your work with a therapist or just as a couple. So we're going to talk a little bit about um, female sexual pain disorders. There are a lot of reasons for female sexual pain disorders, way more reasons than we could possibly ever talk about in, in one session. You can have hormone problems, you can have increased nerve fiber density, you can have graft versus host disease. Um, there's 15 reasons here and there's many, many more other than that. But one of the things that, you know, pain is one of the things that we see most frequently in our office, and I'm going to go over a little bit of stuff on one of the most frequent reasons that we see pain, which is altered hormone integrity, which, once again, after some of the medications you take in chemotherapy, total body irradiation, you can have ovarian failure, so, failure, so you can present with altered hormone integrity. Um, so one of the first things that we do when a patient comes into our office is what's called bulboscopy. It's a way of looking at the genital tissue with magnification, and you really can assess a lot more about genital tissue when you use bulboscopy. You can actually kind of assess a female's hormone status just by looking at the genital tissue. Um, on the side there is a picture of Dr. Goldstein doing bulboscopy. We do it so that everything that we see on the camera is then projected onto a plasma TV in the room so that the patient can see what's going on, they can see where their pain is coming from, and they kind of get to, to look at their anatomy in a way they've never seen it before. Um, when you look at anatomy, things like your clitoris is very testosterone dependent. If you have low testosterone for one reason or another, you can actually find change in size of clitoris. You can find shrinkage of clitoris. If you replace testosterone, you can see that kind of grow and uh, regain its robustness. Um, labia minora, is that a word even? <laughs> um, labia minora are very estradiol dependent. So when you're low estrogen, you'll see changes in labia minora. Um, the vestibular glands, which are little glands around the open 
opening of the, of the vagina. This is an area that can really cause women a lot of pain. Um, when you don't have adequate hormone status, those little glands are starved for food, basically. Um, they become red, irritated, bacteria get in there. And this is an area where women can get a significant amount of, of uh, vaginal pain, pain with sex, pain just with sitting or wearing pants sometimes. Um, the other thing that we always do is assess nine specific blood tests on, on any woman, and there's nine for men, nine blood tests for men too, slightly different. Um, we assess nine different blood tests, and we have a range that we want each of these blood tests to kind of be within. Um, but the big thing that we look at a lot of the time is the testosterone level, because testosterone, like we said in the slide before, is really important for the function of your genital tissues, not just men's genital tissues, but of women's genital tissues. So what we want to know is what is your free testosterone level. When you look at total testosterone, you're looking at the amount of testosterone in your body that's bound or in storage, and you're looking at the amount that's free and available for use. And only about 2% of your testosterone is actually available for use. Um, so you can go online, you can find this nifty little calculator that's actually online for anybody to see, and you can calculate how much testosterone you actually have free and available for use. And a lot of women who have very low free testosterone in their body will have, um, will have pain uh, associated with that. So if you have altered hormone integrity, if you're a postmenopausal woman, if you're a woman that's had uh, ovarian failure, these are the five key strategies that we're going to use for you, which would be treating your whole body with testosterone, estrogen, and progesterone, and then using local hormone to the vagina and the vestibule. And the vestibule is the opening of the vagina. Um, some, some women might have 24-7 pain. Some women may just have pain with intercourse. It just depends on the purpose. The person, but we see people who can't sit, can't stand, can't sleep. Um, it just affects their daily functioning. And uh, ultimately, when someone's in pain, doesn't matter what it, it is, if it's a sexual problem or not, that can cause relationship distress. And although a sex therapist can't take away your pain, they can provide you with uh, pain management skills, uh, education, um, and address any of the psycho psychological components to the pain. Um, in addition, um, they can provide you with coping strategies and shift the focus away from intercourse. So a lot of times couples come to me, they want to have intercourse, but they're having pain. And if they're not having intercourse, they're not having any sexual activity at all. And um, there's so many things that you can do outside of intercourse. If someone has pain, you can use a vibrator on the clitoris. You can use what we call a masturbation sleeve. I have a picture of one at the bottom. I know it seems silly, but it, it can be really helpful for a lot of couples. It basically mimics what it feels like to be inside of a woman. And so uh, the, one of the partners can use it um, with the other partner, or it, sometimes they can be cut in half and so like if it's hard to penetrate um, it will allow for just part of the penis to go inside instead of the whole thing and we don't have our physical therapist with us today but they are so important in terms of pain issues and in, in dealing with the the changes in musculature um, and Catherine and I were just talking about earlier I always say to my patients if you feel like you get slapped in the face every time you ate ice cream even though ice cream is super yummy, you don't want to eat it anymore, right? Because the negative reinforcement. So a physical therapist can help with that as well. So the thing we're going to talk about is arousal disorders. So hypoactive sexual desire disorder, that's basically the, the same thing as having a low libido or a low sex drive. Um, and we do see a lot of patients that have low sex drive are going to be caused for different reasons, low testosterone, medications you're on, chronic illness, pain. Um, but when you think about sex drive, there are things that are going to stimulate or excite, and there are things that are going to inhibit. There's chemicals in the brain, and certain chemicals are going to stimulate or excite your sex drive, and certain chemicals are going to inhibit your sex drive. You need, for adequate sexual functioning, you need to have a balance of those. You can't have your inhibition really high, your excitation really low, or the other way around, or it's going to cause an imbalance in, in your sex drive. So people who have low sexual desire, uh, Dr. Goldstein always describes it as you're driving a car with the brake on. So it just doesn't work quite right. Um, 
There are other things like biological factors that are going to affect these chemicals in the brain. So if you have chronic illness, if you have chronic pain, um, it's going to set these chemicals that are supposed to be imbalanced in the brain out of whack a little bit and can potentially cause low sexual desire in a lot of people. The other thing is low testosterone, like we said, from medications, from treatments. Um, having the low testosterone also sets the chemicals in the brain out of balance, and you don't have the correct balance to have adequate sexual functioning. And we can help bring the, the balance of these chemicals so you're driving your car and you're not driving it with the brakes on, um, and help balance out the chemicals in the brain to increase sexual desire. And compared to the other sexual problems that we've talked about so far, uh, low desire has a huge psychological component. Energy can play a huge, uh, big component if you're tired, you're trying to raise kids, you're, you're um, trying to get your health back, and you're trying to uh, manage your career, all those things, and then sex is the last thing that you want to think about. Um, those can impact your desire levels. Also mental health, feelings of attractiveness, the time of day, sometimes people might feel more sexual in the morning because they're well rested. Um, also, thoughts during sexual interactions. So, for instance, if you um, can't have trouble focusing when having sex because of your thinking about maybe infertility issues, fear of pregnancy, or even maybe before you had a bone marrow transplant, there was some history of sexual abuse or whatnot, all those different things can affect your sexual function. In addition, it could um, your desire can be affected by your partner's technique or if they know what they're doing. Um, so that's something a sex therapist can help with as well. And then also feeling like you have a place for uh, with privacy. <coughs> so next thing we're going to talk about is orgasmic disorders. And I think we're getting close. What is, are we at five minutes? Okay. So we're going to go kind of quickly through that. And then hopefully you'll, you'll be able to ask a lot of questions as well. Um, delayed ejaculation or anorgasmia in male is just basically when it takes a lot really long time for a male in, to be able to orgasm or ejaculate. And there's lots of different reasons for these. One of these is um, antidepressants or depression. And one could be that they're just not getting the stimulation that they need. So there's lots of different things that are available. Um, not many people know, but you can use a heightener. Um, so like the one we have here is extreme. It's just from like, a, you can buy it online. It's from pureromance.com and it's usually they're menthol based. Um, also, if you put a vibrate, vibrator in the prostate region, so that's like in your perineum, which is basically like if this is your scrotum and this is your anus, if you put a vibrator there, that can be really helpful in inducing orgasm. Also, depends on your comfort level, but inserting a finger in the anus, um, you can stimulate what we call the G-spot for men, which is basically the stimulating the prostate can help men who are struggling with orgasm difficulties. Um, and then for women, there's lots of different things available. There's vibrators, and we, we, we brought a bunch of different ones if you want to come see them at the end, or if um, we can pass them around too. It's up to you. <laughs> Um, but this can be very helpful. I call, I often call vibrators the hearing aid for the clitoris or the prostate. Um, so that this allows you to kind of help the process along. There's also a couple of vibrators available. I don't think a lot of couples know, but there's some that a um, man can put on his penis or a woman can insert it into her vagina that can stimulate both partners. And I talked a little bit about arousal creams already. And in addition, I'm sure you've all heard of Fifty Shades of Grey, right? I read it, and I, Catherine actually borrowed it. It's not the, like, best book in the world, right? Like, it's not, but you know why it was so popular? Because people like that. People want to fantasize. And so there's a lot of different things out there that you can use to help kind of heighten the experience and spice your sex life up. Um, in addition, there's lots of different things that sex therapists can do um, with you to help increase your ability to orgasm, such as getting to know your partner's body, bodies better, um, either through sensate focus or directed masturbation. And then also to explore any inhibitions that might pre be preventing you from orgasming. So for instance, a lot of women might be afraid to orgasm because they think that they're going to urinate, right? Maybe they, they have incontinence issues. Um, and a lot of women might not know this, but sometimes what the, the um, fluid that comes out isn't necessarily urination. It could be ejaculate. Women do ejaculate, and they've done research it's the, the quality of the fluid is different than urination or, or urine. <laughs> um, and so um, by preventing themselves from urinating, they actually might be pre preventing themselves from having an orgasm. 
So what about sex after a bone marrow transplant? So I kind of came up with some things that I thought might be helpful. We talked about vibrators, dildos, remote control dildos. There's also pillows. I don't know if you can see those those little squares, that square there, that some types, some types of um, pillows that allow you to position yourself different can help make sexual function um, better. Maybe focusing on other things than intercourse, so like kissing, using different positions, exploring each other's bodies. Um, and then last, just so you know uh, how to find a sex therapist, phys pelvic floor physical therapist, or sexual medicine physician in your area, we provided some links to different websites that could be helpful. So for a sex therapist, the professional organization is known as ASACT, the American Association of Sex Educators, Counselors, and Therapists. You go to their website, locate a professional, and you can find one in your area. Um, there's also us, of course, San Diego Sexual Medicine, and then there is sex ma sexhealthmatters.org, which is the society, the National Society for Sexual Medicine. Um, and there's a few websites where you can find pelvic floor physical therapists in your area. Wherever you're from, you can just put in your zip code here, and it'll pull up pelvic uh, floor physical therapists in your area. There are also several uh, websites where you can find different sexual enhancement products that you may want to use if you're not comfortable with going into a store to, to buy anything like that. And there's sexualmed.org. That's really a fabulous website that has stories from people who have sexual dysfunction, patients, they're patients from our clinics, patients from all different clinics from across the country, um, and they're just posting their problems and how they found treatment and help for their problems and kind of trying to guide other people on where to go to get help because, like we said, it's just not something that's really talked about a lot. So this is where you can find real people that have found help for sexual problems and, and how they did it. And this is our last slide. We also just have some books that we recommend to people that might be interesting. And Katz has written two books that um, that can be helpful. And in addition, just so you know, we have what we call triage calls that are free. So if you are kind of interested in learning more about your sexual health, or you think that you have a sexual health problem that you want to just like talk to the doctor that we work with, um, Dr. Erwin Goldstein, about. He, you can just call our office. We left um, little cards and little um, things about uh, San Diego sexual medicine in the back. And you can call the phone number, schedule a triage call, and then just ask him about your sexual health problem. And he can refer you to someone in your area or tell you um, what, he, what his kind of opinion is on the matter. So thank you so much for having us. And um, we'll turn it over to you. Thank you both very much. Uh, we're going to ask that you hold your questions until all the speakers are done. And uh, Dr. McCauley from UC San Diego is our next speaker. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me here. Um, I have to find my talk, though, so just a second. Wait, where? Sorry, you guys. Um, can you pull it up for me? I'm Dr. Catherine McCauley. I'm in OBGYN. I'm on faculty at um, UC San Diego Medical Center. And I'm the director of the UCSD Menopause Health Program. Um, so one of my specialty interests is, is menopause, um, and there's a great overlap with um, sexual medicine in that area. So what I'm going to talk about today, where's the slideshow, I just press over. Yeah. So I'm going to talk about, um, uh, Rose and Catherine mentioned um, a cause of sexual pain or a, a cause that we can see um, sometimes after bone marrow transplant. It's a very specific topic, graft versus host disease of the female genital tract. So this is... Um, when chronic graft-versus-host disease actually involves the vulva or, and or vagina. And why it's important to just be aware of this um, as a complication after bone marrow transplant is that it's often, by providers who are not aware of this condition, often mistaken as just atrophy or thinning of the vaginal tissues associated with menopause. So um, as Rose also mentioned, um, Menopause changes can occur um, as a result of um, therapies um, and, and treatment um, before bone marrow transplant. Um, so often you'll see both problems kind of possibly coexisting. But the important thing is to be aware um, that this can occur um, because if untreated, it can be a very significant cause of sexual um, problems and, and sexual pain. What it is is an immune disorder that occurs as a late complication of stem cell transplant. 
Vulvovaginal graft-versus-host disease can cause pain and long-term complications of scarring in the vaginal canal, which can sometimes be quite severe. This can have adverse effects on intimacy, sexual function, and quality of life, and as I just mentioned, can coexist with the disruption of ovarian function um, and is often misdiagnosed as just a menopausal condition. Um, this condition, genital graft-versus-host, can affect um, the genital tract in females in 25 to 49% of stem cell transplant survivors. There's not a huge body of literature on this um, condition, but, but there are more and more um, studies and, and reviews of patients with this condition um, that's emerging in the literature. Volar symptoms can occur first. The median is 7 to 10 months post-transplant. And the vaginal disease can occur years later. The latest reported case was 8 years post-transplant. Most cases, 68% involve the vulva only, and 26% will involve both the vulva and vagina. But often the vulvar symptoms are what you'll see first, so that's, we're going to talk about that in a little bit too, what symptoms to look for. Um, this graphers host of the genital, female genital tract was first described in 1982. There were five cases of severe vaginal scarring that required surgery. And in most of the cases, menstrual flow was blocked by the scar tissue, causing what we call a, a blood-filled vagina or hematocolpos. And the patients were successfully treated with surgery to remove the scar tissue, and then use of estrogen and vaginal dilators postoperatively. So as Rose and Catherine mentioned, estrogen is, is commonly used locally in the vagina for menopausal symptoms associated with vaginal atrophy. Um, and while it's not the sole treatment of graft versus host, it certainly is still an important part of um, treating the tissues if menopause has also occurred. So the symptoms of vulvovaginal graft versus host include um, dryness, vaginal dryness, burning, itching, tenderness to touch on the vulvar area, painful intercourse with penetration of the vaginal opening and or with deep penetration of the vagina, and then amenorrhea, cyclic pelvic pain, uh, unable to insert the tampon, could be due to severe um, vaginal scarring. So the amenorrhea would be if the vaginal scarring is so severe that actually you can't see that there's any blood flow occurring, and that can certainly cause a lot of pelvic pain. And then also, if, if one's unable to insert a tampon, that would indicate possibly severe scarring. But fortunately, that's less common, particularly if the vulvar symptoms are, are, are diagnosed first early on and there's treatment that's initiated early. So the signs that we would look for on exam is redness of the vulvar tissue, which can be either patchy or diffuse redness. Tenderness of the gland openings in the vulvar vestibule, and that's just even with gentle touch with a Q-tip. Erosions or fissures, open sores that can look like genital herpes, so we'll often test for herpes as well, just to rule that out. Vulvar scarring, which could include um, fusion of the labia or the clitoral hood. And scarring of the vaginal canal, which can range from anywhere in the early stages, thin, filmy scar tissue, which can sometimes just be um, mechanically... Um, broken up with dilators um, versus dense scarring, which sometimes requires surgery. Now, genital atrophy um, can also, as I said, often is occurring at the same time. Um, atrophy of the vulva and vagina can occur with disruption of ovarian function at time of menopause or due to chemotherapy radiation. So this is the effect of low estrogen levels over time on the vaginal tissues. Causes th the low estrogen levels causes thinning and decreased elasticity of the vaginal walls, a decrease in vaginal lubrication, but scarring is not typical. So most women going through a natural or induced menopause will not, um, will not really get scarring in the vaginal area. So that, that is unique to graft versus host. But you can see here as the symptoms are quite similar. So they really, they really overlap a lot. So if a woman were to come in and say she's having dryness burning and she's postmenopausal, and these vulvar symptoms, the first thing many providers will think of is, is atrophy and, oh, you just need some estrogen. Um, but if it's a transplant survivor, the awareness of graft, graft versus host needs to be there. So the difference also is in the physical exam. The symptoms may sound similar, but once a physical exam is performed, you can also often tell the difference between the two. With atrophy, you'll have pale pink vaginal walls. The vaginal tissue often bleeds easily with contact if the atrophy is severe. And the labia look thinner, and they sometimes fuse together in the long term. With graft versus host, though, there's more erythema, or what we, or redness, I should say, of the vulva, um, more tendency towards erosion, sores, or fissures, which we don't see in atrophy. Again, as I mentioned before, the tenderness of the vulvar glands, and then the scarring. If it's actually difficult to insert a speculum, or you actually see areas, ridges of scar tissue, that's indicative of graft versus host. Uh, the key, though, is to recognize the problem, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, um, you'd want to listen to the patient's history of the vulvar vaginal symptoms, 
do a careful physical exam inspecting the vulva, vagina, and the area between the vagina and anus called the perineum. Assessment of redness of glands in the vulva, which we call the vestibular glands, and tenderness of touch with cotton tip swab. And then perform a gentle digital vaginal exam assessing for scarring, the size of the opening, and the length of the vagina. So um, I, I mentioned the vaginal exam. Also, we would rule out infection. I mentioned herpes earlier. Um, and also obtain a pap smear of the cervix if that's due. Some patients who are chronically immunosuppressed have a higher likelihood of having human papillomavirus or abnormal pap smears. Um, I mentioned culturing any open sores, but biopsy is not always necessary if the vulva is very tender. So the last thing that any of my patients want if they suffer from this condition, and I, and I do have a, a few patients with this condition currently, um, is to actually have you say, well, next I'm going to you know, inject some lidocaine there and, and, and take this little instrument and cut out a piece of tissue. Then they're really going to be tender. So the idea of a biopsy is often very frightening to these patients who are already having a lot of pain and sensitivity in the area. So I think often with, if the clinical history fits and the appearance is consistent, we can just empirically treat if we suspect it's graft versus host. But some people do prefer to do biopsy to confirm. Um, so treatment would be with topical steroids, um, uh, generally. Um, and that would be topically in the form of an ointment that could be, could be um, applied to the vulva or vagina. Um, other topical immunosuppressant meds have been described um, for use as well in different studies. And estrogen therapy is important too, um, because as I said, atrophy can be coexisting with this problem. And, and he, to optimize healing of the tissue and to minimize any effects of, on intercourse, painful um, problems with intercourse, then estrogen would also be advised. So that can be applied as a cream, a ring, or a vaginal tablet. Some authors who have studied this problem have, um, one, one set of authors recommended the ring. It's actually a three-month flexible um, low-dose estrogen releasing ring that's used to treat atrophy. And they had good success with, after they treated the patient's with um, the topical steroids and used dilators to break up any scar tissue. They found patients who kept that ring in, maybe the ring there somehow prevented scarring from occurring again. They found that that was actually very helpful. But different ways to give the estrogen, as I said, a cream, a ring, or a tablet. Vaginal dilators, which I mentioned, if there's um, milder scarring, that can certainly help. Um, and then surgery um, in rare cases if there's severe scarring. So improvement may be seen in up to two to four weeks um, with daily application of the topical steroid ointments. We don't want to use the steroid ointments too long because there can be a side effect um, with overuse of actually worsening of symptoms or thinning of the, of the skin. Um, so we would taper off to two to three times a week once the area has healed. Though if there's actually open sores, erosions, and fissures, that may take longer, six to eight weeks to heal. Um, but the long-term use of local estrogen is going to be important, too, to prevent further thinning of skin and mucosa, but alone is not usually going to be an adequate treatment for graft-versus-host in this area. So in summary, um, graft-versus-host of the vagina and vulva can lead to reduced quality of life due to pain and sexual dysfunction. Early recognition of the problem is key in preventing long-term complications in the genital tract. Estrogen therapy alone is not sufficient treatment, but is an important combination of topical therapies with steroids, estrogen, and vaginal dilators. Um, and Rose and Catherine also mentioned the role of pelvic floor physical therapists, who can also be very helpful and important in helping patients understand how to use dilators. Um, and uh, often I'll refer my patients to pelvic floor physical therapy as well if they're suffering from these problems, part of their healing. So that is all I have on that topic, but um, we'll be open for questions. We should have a lot of time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we do have some time for questions. We have some volunteers walking around, and we have our first question in the back there. I went through a uh, stem cell transplant uh, actually two years ago yesterday, and um, prior to that, there were no sexual dysfunction problems. For the first year after the stem cell transplant, we were told by our oncologist up at OHSU to avoid sex, uh, which I didn't quite understand. But now that we're at a point where we can have sex, I'm having a difficult time getting a full erection. I am on uh, testosterone. My first testosterone count was less than a little boy at 10. Now back up to about 900. So that's helping. But on these, my question basically is on these creams and stimulators, are there specific brands that we should be looking for? This 
is this the stuff that we see at the local grocery store for ten dollars or yeah, or is it a prescription do we need to go to a doctor to get this and the follow-up question is relevant to the uh, the penile injection how do we get that and is that again prescription or over the counter or so the Thank creams um, that we're talking about, the arousal creams, those you can just get, like, um, oftentimes I recommend pureromance.com. It's uh, it's just like a website. They do, like, in-house parties and stuff like that. Um, so, um, but that is more for orgasm problems. So for erectile issues, I think that's definitely something that you're going to want to go to your doctor because it could have nothing to do with the bone marrow transplant. And um, there's a lot of different things I'll have Catherine. Um. So the problem is, once again, going back to a lot of providers aren't comfortable talking about sex, and there isn't really a lot of education on sex. Um, so when you go to your doctor and say you're having problems with erectile function, most of them know to give you Viagra and then don't know a lot on how to go past that. Um, for men, a certain degree of erectile problems, Viagra doesn't work anymore. It doesn't do anything for you. Um, so you do, the injections are prescription, but you're not going to go to your regular primary care probably and get them. They can refer you to a urologist. Um, I'm not sure if all urologists, I do not believe a lot of urologists are potentially go into this area, but a urologist is more likely place to get it. Um, your sexual medicine doctors, though there aren't a lot out there, are definitely a place you can get it, but it is prescription medication that you will need. And it's kind of the step past Viagra. If Viagra isn't working well anymore, um, that's where we would go next. The other thing is to get an evaluation to figure out why your erection doesn't isn't what it used to be. Um, it can be blockage. I mean, it's a complex to go into explain all of it, but it can be blockage. It can be leakage. Um, there's different different reasons that you have erectile problems. Or it could even be the medications that you're on. I mean, the doctors, you know, giving these medications don't tell you. So to even talk to your doctor about is, is some of the medications I'm on causing the erectile dysfunction. And another thing that um, that you had kind of mentioned is to find a sexual medicine physician in your area, that website, I think it's sexualhealthmatters.org. Mm -hmm. um, also, if you, um, like I said, if you take one of our cards um, and you even call in, Dr. Goldstein can help refer you to someone in your area as well. Do we have um, internet access? We're still working on the vulva picture, so. Do we have anyone? Question here. Question right On your chart of physical causes of ED, you have neurological, vascular, and hormonal. You list hyperprolactinemia. Could you give me the flow chart on how that occurs? Hyperprolactin, I think, did we take it off? There was hyperprolactinemia written on there at one point. Um, hyperprolactinemia, if you have a tumor, a small tumor in the brain that's going to secrete prolactin. Prolactin is sexually, it's one of the chemicals in the brain that is sexually prohibitive. Um, so one of the tests that we do on men and women all the time is a prolactin test. It's really, really rare you're going to pick up on this. It's not very common at all. Um, but if you pick up um, on a high prolactin level, it can be that you have a tumor that is secreting prolactin, and that is sexually prohibitive. Um, I just want to thank you for this presentation. It's such an amazing eye-opener. And um, I did have a question in terms of alternative treatments. Are you able to reference a website if you're looking at hormonal um, alternative natural treatments? Could you recommend a resource? Thank you. Uh, well, one of my favorite sites is um, for menopause symptoms, for menopause information in general, is the North American Menopause Society. Their website is menopause.org. Um, and I, it, they have lots of patient information, um, lots and lots of information about menopause, um, symptoms, treatments, hormones, alternatives, vitamins, bone health, all, all sorts of things. So um, I, I think that's a, ni a nice resource. Very balanced information um, and medically sound. Menopause.org, North American Menopause Society. Um, one, the first one is uh, is... 
systemic um, HR hormone replacement therapy, um, safe if you have uh, stable um, breast nodules. And the second question is, well, kind of related to that is, can, would it be safer than if not, if it's not safe to use like the, the cream or the ring, and are those equally effective for the, um, for the vaginal, the thinning tissue? And sometimes I've no, I noticed that I was on hormone replacement for a while to try to treat that. Um, we assumed it was just the thinning of the tissue and stuff. But um, it seemed that I had more pain after I was on the ring for sure. So I didn't know if there was a period of time where you experience that pain when the tissue is trying to like build itself back up. Okay, I can... I can answer that. The, the, I might ask you a question. The stable breast nodules, I, is that what you said? I just want to make sure I was, heard you correctly. Yeah, I have just two nodules that's been there for like three years. They haven't changed any. And no biopsies or they think oh, it's a... They sit. did do t biopsies and they said it was, I a don't know. A fibroadenoma? Or yeah, exactly. Okay. I forgot I the mean, name. Some, our breast specialists do feel that, you know, hormone therapy potentially could promote growth of, or birth control pills even in younger patients of the fibroadenomas. They are benign, um, but, and they're, one fibroadenoma alone is not a risk factor for breast cancer, but as you start to get into having two or multiple and multiple breast biopsies, that, that can, um, potentially be a risk factor for breast cancer. So even though they're benign. So, um, so it kind of, it kind of depends. I mean, um, Certainly, the local estrogen, though, should just as effectively, in some cases, be, maybe better, uh, be better to relieve the symptoms associated with vaginal atrophy than the systemic hormone therapy alone. So if hot flashes and night sweats are not a big bother, I'd be totally comfortable with having you use vaginal estrogens, whether it's the cream gel or the cream the tablet or the ring. Um, the vaginal estrogen has not been shown to increase the risk of breast cancer. Um, but because it has estrogen in it, it gets a big black box warning on it. So I have lots of patients who say, wait, this, you didn't tell me it's going to cause breast cancer and strokes and blood clots, but then I have to explain. No, they just have to put that as a class label. It contains estrogen. It says that. But when you're delivering the estrogen in such a very, very low dose, just locally in the vagina, there's been no evidence linking that use of estrogen to breast cancer or blood clots or strokes. Or So I, I'm very comfortable with that. I use vaginal estrogens a lot. Um, and but with your breast stimulation, it, it that's a little could be a little more complex. I think I need to know more specifically what was seen and and your history a little bit better to really recommend that. But um, but ultimately, with deciding whether you use the systemic hormone therapy, even in the setting of the breast nodules, it would really depend, I think, on how much you're suffering from the other symptoms. If you're really bothered by hot flashes and sleep disturbance, night sweats, things like that. Yeah. So if not, the vaginal is the way to go. Typically, though, the products don't cause the ring shouldn't cause pain. There's not usually a period of pain at first, but I have had patients who have become, who just feel when they've tried to use the creams, actually find that it's just very, the area is already so kind of raw and irritated. It's, it's very, ir sometimes the creams can be irritating. I haven't seen that as much with the ring, but if you're having irritation with one product, then usually we'd recommend trying another, maybe going to the little tablets, the Vagifem tablets might be a better way to go. It could just be having the ring. It's just, this is not comfortable for some people, and that might be your case. And occasionally I'll go to actually patients who seem sensitive to the, the FDA-approved products. Sometimes I'll go to a compounded formulation in an oil, um, a very non-irritating oil, where they can put a little bit of estrogen and testosterone in that, and that can be more soothing. So so there's options. So definitely if you're not feeling like, if you're feeling it's not feeling better, you should talk to your doctor about it. Okay, we're going to answer the vulva question real quick. So <laughs> this is this is the vulva. Um, vulva is basically made of tissue, same as the skin. It's what would can be considered. Ah. Um, it's what would be considered the you know the mons pubis is up here. This is the labia majora through here. This is all vulva. Um, when you go a little deeper, as Dr. Hartzell was trying to explain, um, vulva goes to the point of the labia minora, which are the smaller inner lips that you can see here, halfway down the inside of those. So this little circle, or whatever shape this is, a dotted line here, everything outside that is vulva. Anything inside here is called vestibule, and it's actually completely different tissue than vulva. It's the same tissue that lines the inside of the urethra of a man. 
So the urethra of a man is the same tissue as what's inside this dotted line here until you get to, and my picture moved, I'm sorry, until you get to what's called the hymen. So the hymen is the little pieces of tissue like here, down here, off to the side. Once you hit the hymen, anything inside that is vagina. So those are three very distinct separate areas of a woman's anatomy. Um, the vestibule, this area right here, is often where you can end up with a significant amount of pain. So it's the difference between vulva, vestibule, and vagina. Okay, we have time for a couple more questions. Right here. I went into menopause after um, the radiation and didn't know I was supposed to take care of that with hormone replacement until four, three years, four years later, until things got miserable. So now I'm on that, but I never heard about testosterone. Is, a, is that in, naturally in, in the hormone replacement therapy, or do you have to have something separate? Is that a separate pill, or is it something naturally you can do over the counter? Um, we could probably both add our comments on that, since you guys, I don't know if you guys have comments about that, but it's, it's, um, it's, it's an addition. So it's FD, testosterone, we prefer to use in women topical products like gels or creams. Um, uh, some, I know Dr. Goldstein uses pellets that he sub in, beneath the skin that he puts in um, women. Um, so there's different ways to deliver testosterone, but um, most of us prefer to not use it orally. So, um, and for women, it's FDA approved for men, um, hypogonadal men with low testosterone. It's not FDA approved for women as hormone therapy. So there's a bit of controversy in the medical community um, about the role of testosterone for postmenopausal women, but Many, many menopause experts and gynecologists feel comfortable prescribing it for women off-label in a low dose um, if they have low testosterone and a low, low libido, low sexual drive. We really don't have any medications FDA approved for low libido for women. And um, we almost had a testosterone gel get to the point of being ready to go to the FDA, but that study didn't quite pan out. <laughs> so um, they're kind of re-looking at their data. So, but it, it, so it's, not, it's not an absolute necessity to have testosterone as part of your hormone regimen. Um, you guys may disagree, though. <laughs> Dr. Goldstein would be very upset that I just said that, so don't tell him. Anyway, so, um, but, um, but many women with sexual issues will need some testosterone as well. So it really just kind of depends. But not all women have a low libido or, they, or at the time of menopause. Many do, but some get on hormone therapy, feel better, and just don't feel the need for it. So I think it really depends on, on you know, how you're feeling in terms of the sex drive. Um, and, um, but I, I use it frequently. Many f f providers refer me patients for that purpose. Even the endocrinologists don't want to prescribe it. They're not comfortable with it, so they send the patients to me. Um, but uh, there's a role for it for some women. Okay, I have a question here in the middle. Um, have you ever treated anyone with the vulvovaginal scarring after an autologous stem cell transplant. I keep hearing you say about the GVHD, uh -huh. but um, I have these conditions after, and I had that wonderful little biopsy that they did. It's, it's not pleasant at all. And um, the diagnosis came back as lichen sclerosis. But when I talk to my urogynecologist and to my oncologist, I haven't checked with my transplant doctor. I'm like, they're anomaly. They don't have any other patients that are dealing with this issue after transplant. And I'm thinking, I can't be the only one. That's why I'm from Texas. That's why I came out here because when I saw, thank you for this, because when I saw this topic, I'm thinking, I know I'm not alone. But I just wondered if you've seen it with a, a stem cell transplant from myself. Yes, and so the treatment for lichen sclerosis is topical steroids, actually the same steroid you'd use for GVH there. So the treatment wouldn't be different. But lichen sclerosis I see in the non-transplant population as well. I mean, that's a, that's a different condition, but it's, it's not that uncommon and, and more, it's more common in postmenopausal women. Um, and so, but it's very effectively treated usually with topical steroids. So, um, so that, that is certainly not an anomaly in my practice at all, and, and you are not alone. So, um, like I said, I have a specialty practice where I just see so many women um, with all different types of backgrounds, many cancer survivors as well, transplant survivors, um, with a variety of sexual issues and vaginal, vulvovaginal complaints. So, um, it's, yeah, it's, 
not uncommon. Lichen sclerosis, it's, it's infrequent, but it does have to be monitored um, for developing a, a vulvar cancer. Um, but um, fortunately, that's pretty infrequent that that would happen. And I think it causes symptoms, so that's good. When you have the itching or burning, you kind of get the flare. Um, you would retreat with steroids and just have that, you know, annually checked by a physician. Um, but, um, yeah, so it, it could. It needs to be monitored, but not frequent. Okay, we, this, and then we have one more that, that's going to be our final question over there. Okay, my question is, I had a stem cell transplant. So it kind of has ruined my immune system quite a bit, and I'm sure a lot of people have had the same thing. My question is, you take any kind of drug, and there's going to be some side effects. If you look on PDR, physician's desk reference, there's always a side effect. You see on the commercials, they put all the disclaimers at the end, including getting cancer again. Well, I'm not going to take anything that's going to give me a chance of getting cancer again. How do we know what will and what won't? So anything like the uh, intercavernosal injections to achieve erections, I mean, those are basically, I realize there's a list of interactions for any medication and side effects and all that kind of stuff, but those aren't going to have risks for causing, uh, causing any form of cancer to them. Um, your PD-5 inhibitor, PD-5 inhibitors uh, shouldn't be something, I think, more in the realm of things used to improve erectile dysfunction that have kind of the cancer worry to them would be going into the testosterones, going into the hormone kind of, kind of stuff, which there's a whole theory out there that says that really even with prostate cancers and things like that, that it's not as worrisome as everybody thinks that it is, but that's kind of a separate issue. But really the stuff that we use like Viagra and the, and the intercavernosal injections aren't going to give you um, increased risk for something like that. Okay, we have our, our final question over here. If we have a couple minutes at the end, we'll get maybe one more. Okay, do you find any correlation between vascular blockage in the heart and then with a problem with the uh, erectile? Very much so. I mean, there is the thought that men who start having erectile dysfunction, uh, especially like earlier in age, um, should be checked out for for uh, cardiac problems to uh, you know high cholesterol stuff like that because there is a correlation between the two. You will also see men who have erectile dysfunction at a very early age though that's say um, injury induced like they've had a perineal or like a, a groin injury of some kind and they have a specific blockage from that. But ED and uh, uh, it could be a, yeah, I guess it could be, the way you could say it is it could be a warning sign that you will have cardiac problems or have the potential for cardiac problems. I had a question. We do have one, one minute. If we have one extra question, we have yeah, time for that. Are the uh, long-term use of uh, painkillers, uh, narcotics, uh, incriminated in ED and specifically Vicodin? And specifically, Vicodin. 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 Um, any of the use of pain medications, pain medications in general are sexually prohibitive. So when you talk about that chemical balance in the brain, and you have to balance the kind of excitatory versus the inhibitory, any pain medications that you use are considered inhibitory to sexual function. Um, other than that, too, just chronic use of pain medication can have uh, effects on uh, testosterone um, and, and erectile function, yes. So pain medications are not, not good for erectile health in general. One, one more? Um, I was looking for, um, is there something that you can use in addition to Vagifem? And what I was thinking of is like um, the bioidenticals, but when I discussed it with my doctor, he had said that you really, since they're not FDA approved, you really don't know what's in them. What's your, what's your experience with bioidenticals? And um, well, Vagifem is bioidentical. 
Oh, so is it? That's the confusion is what does that term even mean? It's not a medical term. Um, uh -huh. It's kind of become more of a, I think, a marketing term. But it's, it means basically that chemically the, the structure of the hormone, which in Vagifem it's estradiol, is chemically similar to the structure of the hormones that you use to naturally produce, which is estradiol. Whereas there's other hormones that are synthetic, um, synthetically derived, or derived from, say, Premarin, the urine of pregnant horses, and things like that those estrogen compounds never existed naturally in our bodies. So when we say bioidentical, what most people mean is that it's, it's estradiol structurally similar to the extra estradiol that we that was produced pre-menopause. Um, so yeah, so Vagifem is bioidentical. We have plenty of FDA-approved bioidentical products. Um, natural progesterone. Um, the brand name is Prometrium. It's recently in a generic version now, um, and lots of different estradiol patches, gels, creams, mist rings um, that. Uh, are, are FDA approved products that you could get in a conventional pharmacy. So I prefer to go that route. Um, sometimes a patient will be sensitive to something, as I mentioned before with the uh, vulvar vaginal thing, sometimes I will go to a compounding pharmacy to get something if I, I think they need a different base or an oil base or, or something else. But um, I've had a wide variety of experience with patients coming in on different bioidentical creams um, not necessarily vaginal, but used to treat hot flashes and having sometimes refractory symptoms where they're still having hot flashes and we measure their estradiol level and it's actually very low. So I'm thinking, gosh, what is it getting? Is it absorbing? What's the base that they're using? Is it consistent from, from refill to refill? Are you getting a little different batch each time? So there's some issues with consistency of the product, but um, there's a couple good compounding pharmacies where we are in San Diego. And I know Erwin has one. He's Dr. Goldstein at San Diego Sexual Medicine. Um, uses compounded products as well. So I think if you're comfortable with the pharmacy, um, you could use it. But in general, we have for, in my practice, there's so many FDA-approved products that are available that I generally would recommend that route first, just for consistency of the product. Appreciate it. Thank you. One other comment on that one. I think that what I find in patients a lot is there's a confusion, like the bioidentical thing. I think that people think because it comes from a compounding pharmacy, it's bioidentical, and if it doesn't come from a compounding pharmacy, it's not bioidentical. Mm -hmm. And that's completely not true. What's coming from a compounding pharmacy is bioidentical, but like like Dr. McCauley said, most of the products out there for estrogen treatment are still bioidentical, even though they're not compounded. Yeah. You know, I, I think that's a very good point, because I didn't know that. I think the reason being is if you look at, um, listen to the women's talk shows and Suzanne Summers and all, all of that, they talk about creams that you apply to the skin and not anything, you know, nothing else being bioidentical. So it's interesting. Thank you for that information. All right, at this time I'd like to thank all of our presenters and all of you for attending.